Hi, everyone, and welcome to our fourth webinar. Who, um, for all of those who were invited to submit final applications to CLEAR's Digitizing Hidden Special Collections and Archives program this year. I'm Joy Banks, a member of the CLEAR Grants team, and I'll be starting things off today. My fellow program officers, Becca Kwan, Sharon Burney, and our colleagues, Allison Pope and Diane Ramirez, are also here today to help in the support of facilitating this meeting. Just a couple of reminders to start us out while you're using Zoom today. A live transcript is being generated. So if you'd like to utilize it, you can click on the CC live transcript button at the bottom of your Zoom window. This option might be under the ellipsis if you have your Zoom window um, a little bit smaller than normal. You may also notice that we are still in a regular Zoom meeting space today instead of a webinar. You have control of your own microphones and video, so please be mindful and ensure that you are muted if you aren't speaking. We know sitting on camera in a Zoom meeting can be exhausting, so do feel free to turn that off during the presentation. At times, though, you may wish to unmute or pop on video for discussion or the Q&A. You are also welcome to use the chat box for conversation throughout the meeting today. I know that some of you have been sharing some other resources that might help applicants for, their, um, for the process that we're working through. To open the chat box, box, do be sure you can hover your mouse towards the bottom of the screen and open it manually. The chat defaults to send a message to everyone, but you may also message individuals directly. This session is being recorded. The slides, Q&A, recording, and transcript will be made available on the Apply for an Award page of our website by the end of the week. So if you missed any of the sessions in our series, they're also all available in the same place. Our team would like to acknowledge that as residents of the US, we're speaking to you from the unceded lands of many indigenous peoples. Those of us working at CLEAR are grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on their homeland. And we ask you to join us in acknowledging all indigenous communities, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. As we share a few slides and introduce our guests, we invite you to introduce yourselves in the chat too and to share land acknowledgements for the area where you live or work if you'd like. May our shared acknowledgement and the program we're speaking about today demonstrate CLEAR's commitment to beginning the process of working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. So as we get started today, we're gonna ask you to complete two quick polls that will help today's co-hosts to gauge what among the many aspects of designing a plan for digitization you're most interested in hearing about. So I will post the first one. Um, and these are optional answer if you'd like. The first one is, do you, do you represent an organization with previous experience in digitization projects? Just a couple more moments. And I'll share the results. The majority of you um, have done digitization projects before as a lead um, on them. And there's a handful that have no experience, which is, um, I 
I think really great to see the wide variety. And then one more um, about today's focus. So as I launch it, um, what aspects of planning and project management would you most like to focus on today? There are a few different options. Moving through those. Uh, I should have mentioned that if you want something else focused on that isn't in this list, put it in the chat. Uh, I, I asked politely if there was an other option, but apparently not in Zoom, so. I'll wait one more moment. Seems like answers are still coming in. And it looks like um, planning and timelines is the most common one um, with digital storage and preservation, digital collections platforms, and assessment and reporting also quite high. I'll give Jess and uh, Alana a couple more moments to see those results. So before we hand things over to them, um, we wanted to go over just um, the parts of the application where you'll be asked to provide details of your digitization plan so that you can keep them in mind and map this conversation to your hidden collections proposal. In all things, we want to bring the focus back to what is both achievable and sustainable for your organization. So one central component of the application is the work plan, which is a document um, you'll craft that will expand on your initial timeline to include all the activities related to the project. For the final application, it's important to include very specific details about any collection description and preparation work, the digitization process itself, where your files will go, and the process for ensuring their sustainability and accessibility after the project ends. Next up is um, the capacity section, the slides, um, where you'll be asked to speak to the capacities and strengths of those involved in the project. While this section is very broad, at least some of this response should relate to your capacity to undertake the digitization plan that you've crafted and how these will be expanded through your project. You should also address your capacity to maintain the project's deliverables in the long term. Another component that relates back to this topic is subcontracts. If you're considering the engagement of a vendor or a subcontractor for work in excess of $5,000, we ask that you provide quotes from the individuals, organizations, or companies that you're working with. This session will touch on some of the things to think about um, as you consider making a vendor part of your digitization plan as well. And finally, um, the last section that really relates to this topic is the project outcomes. In this section, you're asked to describe, among other things, the planned digital outputs, online access platforms, and your long-term digital sustainability plan. So I think a lot of that um, was what rose to the top in the polls. So I'm excited um, to be able to dig into that. Okay, 
And as we always do at these sessions, we're going to um, share a quick poll to gauge how you're feeling about today's topic of designing an achievable sustainable digitization plan. We'll be continuing to collect your feedback also about this webinar series via post-session surveys. So we'll share the link to that in the chat now. So you can encourage you to open it up so you don't forget to submit it after the presentation. And then we'll be back at the end of the session to contribute during the question and A. So how prepared do you feel to develop the application proponents we'll discuss? Next slide. We got pretty much all of those. Let's see. So everybody's finishing up. Okay. Yeah. Looks like we had the results prepared. and everybody. <laughs> yeah, everybody looks somewhat prepared. Great. Okay. So I'm going to go on and introduce our speakers for today. Alana Mayer is an archivist and a librarian and a writer in Hamilton, Ontario. She is currently the digital archivist with the Canadian Friends Historical Association, and she's also working on digitally preserving the research outputs of the adapting Canadian work and workplaces to climate change, SSHRC funded project. She's worked every part of a digitization project, planning, grant writing, uh, buying equipment, community consultation, hiring and training staff and volunteers, copyright and training, um, copyright, metadata, privacy, records management, archival appraisal, destruction, and many hours of sitting at a scanner. And Jess Bosgate is the project's coordinator for our, our digital world. Jess is a graduate of the University of Victoria and University of Toronto with a master's degrees in English literature and information studies. Jess has been involved in or managed larger scale digitization projects since 2005, including the Robert Graves Diary Project and Agnes MacPhail, don't please correct me if I pronounce that incorrectly, Digital Collection and Gray Highlands Digital Newspaper Collections, as well as shepherding dozens of newspaper and multimedia digitization projects of grassroots and large organizations in her role at Our Digital World. Jess lives and works in an off-grid house in Prince Edward County, Ontario. And we're gonna turn the screen over to our presenters today. Hi, uh, this is Jess Pawsgate speaking, and I will start by um, recognizing that today is the inaugural day of truth and reconciliation here in Canada, um, and as it should be every day. Uh, but I would like to acknowledge that I live on the territory of the St. Lawrence Iroquois, the Wendat, Anishinaabewaki, Mississauga, and most recently the Haudenosaunee Mohawk Nation as a settler and a guest today as a result of the Crawford Land Purchase and the Gunshot Treaty. As a non-Indigenous person, I am a visitor and have a treaty obligation to take care of this land, and I endeavor to continue to learn and live accordingly. I would also like to thank the grants team at CLEAR for this opportunity to speak with all of you and to work with Alana, who's a, a colleague of mine from the past, and so um, I'm happy to be here, Alana. Um, I hope I shared my screen properly. No one has registered any complaints. Great. Um, hi, I am really honored to be here chatting with you all today. I'm so happy to have been asked. I live in Hamilton, Ontario, which is the traditional land of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, uh, the Mississaugas of New Credit. Uh, prior to that, the neutrals, as we know of them now. Um, and for thousands of years before that, of course, many other communities uh, and peoples who lived and traded here. 
Um, in Canada, it is the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. Um, I'm hoping that we could have some discussion in that context because I think part of being sustainable and achievable is, is maintaining good relationships with your communities um, and understanding how it is uh, to ethically steward the materials of the people um, whose, whose materials you have. Now I have to figure out, there we go, if I know how to change slides. <laughs> So today we're going to be talking about designing an achievable, sustainable digitization plan. Elena and Sheena um, and Elena and I will get this rhythm going here in a minute. <laughs> Um, I just want to say that we are hoping to spend most of the time doing Q&A, so if you have questions already um, about the sort of nitty gritty technical details, no question is too small or too niche or uh, boring. Um, we, we live in our professional lives for the nitty gritty technical stuff, so please ask. Um, what I think we're going to do in these slides is do sort of a broad um, overview of, of some, some questions we think you might have and maybe some things that you haven't thought about yet that I'd like to personally implant in your brain. Um, the slides are going to be here for you to reference later and in the Q&A if you want more detail about something we can come back to it, but we're going to try and zip through these slides I think so that you have more time for your questions. Oh, I guess I could read the slide out if I, uh, if I knew how to do that. Um, so uh, we're going to talk a little bit about organizational capacity. We're going to talk about um, your collections and converting them. We're going to talk about community, as I said before. Um, we're going to talk a bit about assessment and impact. Uh, and then I'm not at all going to talk about the environment. And we're going to get straight to the Q&A. Uh, there are the controls. OK. OK. So. Um, as Elena said, we want to touch on some general rules of thumb for these kinds of large scale digitization projects uh, through this session. I expect uh, that some of the information we're covering will be familiar to many of you. Um, hopefully, we're, we'll also raise some questions and, and points of interest that are new to you. But um, at some points, it might be very high level and um, I hope it isn't too high level. But like Alana said, please ask questions about your specific uh, needs or, or interests because we can try and answer those as well. What we're trying to do is just set up kind of the, the structure of um, project planning and touch on as many aspects of that and, uh, and how to implement a project as possible so that uh, your questions can come to us afterwards and we can uh, hopefully raise a few ideas and cover off um, some others as we go forward. So. Let's start at the at the wide end of the funnel. Um, many of you, like I say, um, have done this before. Uh, according to the poll, 50% have led a large scale or even a digitization project at their institution. So I just wanted to cover off um, some terminology, project versus program. When you're proposing a digitization project, most funders want to advance their mission, which is true of pretty much every um, every funding organization. So this means they're looking to see long-term effects and impact even for short-term projects. What you want to do when you're building a grant application is to present your project initiative as part of a program and that this project that you're proposing will build your criteria to establish and advance a program at your institution. You can use projects, uh, what we, we refer to as one and done. You can use a project as a one, a, uh, an opportunity to set up policies, procedures, workflows, standards, and best practices, um, as well as obviously accomplishing one or more cycles of digital collection building for discovery. Um, but it does mean that you're working toward uh, building that program. I'll go to the next slide. And so by program, this is really what more what we're talking about here, which is long term thinking and planning. This starts with your project, but it becomes part of the pro of the program plan. So while you're doing this, don't forget to engage and involve your community. This is part of your sustainability. It provides opportunity for resource sharing for one thing, but it also builds community investment and a stronger foundation on which the program can be sustained over time. So consider that each project cycle within a program can offer a chance for reviewing and refining your approach, whether you're correcting mistakes, 
creating efficiencies or meeting new technology requirements as you move forward. And next slide. So this is something I keep sort of on my mental desktop at all times because planning a digitization project does require a little humility. No matter how much you plan, um, probably even no matter how much expertise you have, chances are you won't be able to account for everything at the outset. So the trick is to try and think about every dark corner that you're going to be going into and shed some light on them. So in your planning process, when you're thinking about your goals, your timelines and your deliverables, be very specific and be realistic. And we'll talk more about some of the nuts and bolts around that. Basically though, planning means knowing what you need done, how you need it done, who's going to do it, how they're going to do it, and by when, and don't forget to anticipate the risk of something going wrong and how you're gonna work around those situations. So this is just your general uh, approach to the planning uh, process. Over to you. Um, I think that sustainable and achievable means, as Jess said, lots of humility, um, knowing what you can do, knowing what you can't do. And it, sometimes it can be a bit dour, um, you know, uh, hope for the best plan for the worst is really useful. And as that lovely, excellent quote said, um, uh, of carefully planned only takes twice as long. Um, it's really important for you to sit down and think uh, in terms of succession planning and long-term planning uh, for something that gets digitized and put into a digital preservation system, how long can you really steward it? What will your organization look like in 20 years from now or 50 years from now? Um, heritage is unfortunately an industry that is not always reliable and is definitely not always expanding. Some of your institutions are, some of you are from, from government departments and, and universities that might be able to steward things for a really long time. And some of them, you, some of you, you might not know, your funding just isn't that stable. Um, so it's also useful for those larger institutions to think about how they might be part of someone else's succession planning to steward materials that these independent nonprofits can't steward in the future. Um, because uh, heritage, of course, is not a competition. It's uh, really a collaborative field. So we need to think about how we support each other as well. Uh, um, I want to talk about your reputation just a little bit. Um, when I say that grant funded projects start you at a disadvantage, it is a bit about what Jess was saying. Um, you can use projects as a way to argue for programs, but at the same time, this particular grant uh, asks you to argue why your project cannot be supported by the organization uh, or your partners. Um, if you're annexing this kind of project and amplifying hidden voices kind of project to an extraneous goal, instead of being able to argue that it's a core priority, um, taking on a grant like this uh, sort of reinforces that unless you can really, really work on your institutional internal understanding at the same time that you're working on this uh, project, extraneous project. Um, if you do have an internal budget that can cover projects like these, you should use it. You really should use it. Um, and if you need to be lobbying, you should make plans to do that while you're doing this. Um, it's, uh, it's really unfortunate that culturally significant projects like these end up getting funded through these sort of extra side projects. Um, at the same time, you need to understand what you're committing to. You need to think about maintenance tasks many years in the future. You also don't want to burn yourself out when you take on a project like this that sits on top of your already existing workload. And the last thing you want is to finish a, a three-year grant program and be so uh, disillusioned with everything that you've just done that you put it aside and don't look at it for five years. Um, but your emotions are important. And understanding how you operate a program uh, means understanding how you manage uh, your time and your workload and making sure everybody's happy at the end. That's really what sustainable means to me. Um, investing in your staff, uh, investing in your project staff and your precarious staff, uh, you need to recognize that those people are taking on a, a precarious and time-limited project uh, contract. They will and they should be looking for permanent work the entire time they're with you. Um, if you can't offer it to them, you need to support them when they're doing it. Uh, be prepared for turnover, work it into your own schedule. If you lose a month because one of your staff quits and gives you two weeks notice and it takes you a month to hire someone else, work that into your timelines. Um, that's your planning. It's not their you know, requirement to stick with you at the extent, uh, at the um, 
exemption of their own ability to search, search out permanent work. Um, and I say that you need to mentor them and you need to give them glowing references because that's just how it is, I think. Um, realistic planning, uh, a little bit of what I mentioned before. Um, can you sustain an independent online collection? For example, I work with a historical association right now. We have a, a corporate commercial server that we pay $500 a year for a VPS, a virtual private server. Um, every three years we pay $1,500. Um, that money is not always going to be there. Um, what happens if you go bankrupt 10 years from now? Do you have a succession plan? Do you have a partner who can take it over when you can't? Um, write that in now. Think about that now, plan for it now, put it in your application now. Um, and sometimes it's really boring and technical. Sometimes you just need to sign on an IT department or sometimes you need to sign on um, a whole suite of librarians and archivists who really understand your project and commit to that kind of maintenance as opposed to the technical maintenance. Um, this is uh, something that is very personally near and dear to my heart. Uh, my salary calculation is in the speaker notes, so you can look at the slides later, but I'm just going to go ahead and say 60000 a year, uh, an equivalent yearly salary for everyone that you hire. Um, that's 60000 Canadian. I don't see why it couldn't be 60000 American. I know that's not the actual uh, mathematical conversion, um, but you do have to understand, especially if they're new uh, to the profession or students or recent graduates of a diploma or degree program, um, you're paying for more than just their living moment that they're working for you, also paying for that um, and the cost of making, those uh, making that training happen for that. Um, the next ballpark figure I'm going to give you is add 50% to all your timelines. Uh, Jess's advice was add 100%, make it twice as long. I'm going to say 50%. Um, and that's just because I know that Clear will want you to account for everything. Um, it's really hard to put wiggle room in applications like this. Um, but uh, for me, I think that um, if you do something like the work out the calculations that say your full time staff member can digitize five boxes a week, you know, round that down to three. Um, round it down to three so that you have space for statutory holidays that you forgot about, um, sick days somebody tripping over a power cord and destroying a scanner that takes two weeks to fix, somebody uh, knocking out your project hard drive and losing two weeks of scans. Um, again, planning around someone who leaves and leaves you with a time space of, of hiring somebody new um, and, uh, and making sure that you really have time for training, uh, onboarding and mistakes. I think it's back to Jess, yes. Um, Alana, we did have a question, I think that was directly related to maybe your salary estimates on that one um, about the Mercs, which I'm thinking might be a Canadian phrase. Uh, it doesn't ring a bell to me, but um, mm -hmm. so if, maybe uh, Melissa, you could clarify what you mean by that. I can quickly Google it, but um... <laughs> I was trying to Google it, but I didn't find the answer. <laughs> Um, additional employment costs and I was yeah, I was going to say oh I see I was going to say um no it doesn't it doesn't include any of those things um if you uh uh oh well um uh having not employed anyone for a while um I am a little fuzzy on specifically um I think CPP deductions do come out of a flat salary of 60,000 a year would be pretty normal um if you have other benefits on top, please give them to them. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, but but I'm, I haven't been in a position of getting those benefits in a while, I'll be honest. Um, I will say that Clear has space in this grant. I think it's $10,000 for administrative costs for you know your HR personnel to, to be taking care of these things. I'm not quite sure how that works, but do apply for that because again, your other staff who do other things most of the time um, do need to be only for collaborative projects. Is that correct? I will, I will defer to the, to the uh, grant staff, of course, for some of these questions. Sorry, we can get into some, but we're actually gonna talk more about staffing costs more specifically in our next webinar. Um, but yeah, the, the allowable costs, we do allow definitely for fringe benefits. Um, however, those are calculated in your organization and definitely encourage, um, I won't say insist, we don't require it, but we straight, very strongly encourage you to apply those to whoever qualifies within your organization. Um, but yeah, we'll talk more about the, um, the other parts of that next time. 
Okay, let's, uh, let's get zipping right along if we can. Okay, well, <clears throat> we'll go back to a little bit uh, less human resources for the moment, but um, yeah, thanks Alana for sort of fleshing out some of that contingency planning, um, you know, consider, consider every possibility of what might happen uh, along the route. Uh, you've got lots of things happening and uh, think life isn't always so smooth. Um, but I'm going to start talking about the nuts and bolts of collections and conversion. Um, and I'll try and move through this fairly quickly. I expect most of you have done a lot of this work uh, to begin with, but it's really thoughts around um, the process for converting your physical collections into digital collections and um, who's going to do that for you. Oh, next slide. I was clicking your controls. That didn't help much at all. Um, okay, so this is just a, a kind of a catchy, it's a catchy slide with a few uh, calculations on it. There are two links on this slide and I believe that um, they'll also go up in the chat. These are just uh, calculators. There are lots of them online for figuring out um, how to ballpark the amount of content that you have in a certain storage format or in a certain storage room, let's say, um, to, so that you can project the quantities because you do need to quantify what it is you're going to be digitizing not only for the grant but as you move forward to thinking about how uh, how much staff time it will take what kind of equipment and uh, if you are working with a vendor and i'll talk more about that as i go along but in general um, for the grant prepare a very granular inventory of the material for this project and quantify as closely as possible that how that content will need to be handled and how much will need to be digitized so that you can determine how it will be processed and by extension, how to budget for it as well. So um, we'll talk also about how this affects whether you're going to be digitizing in-house or outsourcing your digitization, because that will depend on your collection content as well as the condition. Um, obviously your budget, your deadlines, and also um, it refers to any policies that you might have about materials staying on site, et cetera. So we'll go to the next one, in-house digitization. So lots of pros and cons to in-house digitization. Um, everyone will want to approach this differently, but there are lots of reasons to do it in-house. Um, obviously, especially if you can't have things leave your, um, your repository, uh, it's very good if you want to maintain complete control, especially over fragile or specialty materials. But it does have, you know, the, the balance to that is that you need the, the matching expertise space and specialty tools to do that digitization. Anyway, I won't read through all the pros and cons, but just consider when you're thinking about in-house digitization, what kind of hardware you'll need, because that will depend on your original formats. Will you need any specialty tools like scanner pens or um, other, other imaging software or conversion tools? Uh, will you need uh, image manipulation software, OCR software? Do you need laptops? Do you need desktops? Do you need um, you know, more computers or more up-to-date computers in order to handle that technology coming in? And then of course, there's the storage. So, um, Will you be using external hard drives? Do you have access to a server? Do you have to um, have certain communication work plans with your IT department to make sure that that server backup is done on a regular, regular basis? All of these things have to be considered as you go forward and never mind the, the simple logistics of space. So depending on your institution, you need to be accommodating all that hardware. Sometimes it can take up floor space, but it's probably going to take up at least extra desks. You're going to have more people moving around in the space, and you'll also be um, bringing, potentially bringing new staff in to an existing team environment. And so there is some interpersonal team um, kind of quality of life that needs to be taken account for as well. So next slide. This is just an example from a project that we did in 2009 to 2011. It was um, regional hubs. We sent out a digitization facilitator who then hired assistants uh, in that regional hub. And uh, there were 10 of them. 
It went over the space of two years and the total budget for the program was $625,000. Of that $625,000, you could see that 92% of that was for staffing. So that was everything from oversight and admin down to the digitization assistance actually digitizing. And the digitization assistance, you can see um, that their time and the budget allotted to them was higher than the fac facilitators even. Um, it's just an interesting lens to look at when you look at how much the equipment cost and then sort of the equivalent amounts of training, travel, and, uh, and marketing and promotion. So really the bulk of um, digitizing in-house, all of this was done in-house, um, went to the digitization assistants and their work in the, in, um, in the hubs. So the other way of going, I'll go to the next slide, is to outsource, obviously. Um, this will depend on your resources. It will also depend on your uh, material quantities and the type of material. Uh, the advantage of outsourcing can outweigh the benefit of scanning or digitizing materials in-house simply for the sake of efficiency, but it also doesn't have to be the only solution. You can um, combine outsourcing with in-house activities um, and apply it only to a portion of your, of your work as well. So at our digital world, we usually send newspaper collections out to digitization vendors for scanning because they can handle systematically a large amount of content in a shorter period of time. They are tooled to do that, whether it's paper copies or micro formats. But then we get the master files back and we do all the derivative file processing and OCRing in-house. And the reason for this is because we have uh, certain platform specifications for display copies, but we also want to ensure that the quality of the OCR output is good um, because this can vary a lot depending on what software the vendors are using. So um, that's just an example of kind of really bulky um, formats, bulky collections in a single format. Um, you may also have to reach out to an outsource vendor, a third party vendor for a specialty conversion for things like audio or video. Um, they will also be tooled up for that kind of thing, the conversion enhancements, you know, uh, noise reduction, that kind of thing. So in that case, it leaves your team more time to do what they specialize in. Maybe it's the transcription the contextualization, the description, that sort of thing. But um, in any case, if you are going to work with a vendor, uh, let's talk a little bit about how to prepare for that conversation. So obviously you want to identify vendors that, are, uh, that have the capacity to do what it is that you need doing, but you also need to be prepared by knowing what it is you need doing. Um, you need to know exactly what you have that you want digitized, if possible, get that vendor to come on site and do an assessment of your collection as well, because they will want to know any variations or, or um, you know, if there's fragile material, if you have specialty, specialty material, if they're going to be needing to take out uh, staples, um, paper clips, anything like that. Um, for image collections, are they just one side or are they both sides? That kind of thing. Um, before you go into the conversations, make sure that you know about them. Try and get community recommendations or else ask them for references from organizations that have had similar projects done by them so that you've got a bit of a reputation uh, background on them. You will always want to get a high resolution master file, whatever, whatever they're converting um, for preservation, but you will also want to ask them if, if you're getting the vendor to do it, to um, provide the search and display derivatives or the play deliver, der, derivatives, excuse me, um, any specific indexing or file naming requirements you have so that when you get your files back, you're able to understand which digital file matches which physical object or format. Mainly, um, the only sort of general advice would be just work with your, with your vendor, have that conversation, 
and make sure that um, you have a lot of back and forth so that they're just as invested in the project as you are by the time you're ready to, to assign the contract. And over to you. Um, I'm going to uh, tackle again from a different angle. I'm going to talk about um, the ways in which uh, you can think about sustainability in terms of your community. Um, particular for this grant, if you are amplifying hidden voices, there's a good chance that your institution is not of the community. Um, I did see the applicant list and I know that some of you are. I'm so excited that you're here. Um, but for some of us working in academic institutions or that sort of thing, um, we're talking about a collaboration that might be with a very different capacity um, so uh, particularly today, of course, um, if you write to uh, a First Nations community and ask them to collaborate with you, they might be busy. They have things that they are doing that are not um, signing your grant application and writing a letter of support. Um, it can be challenging to understand um, a different community's um, sense of who has responsibility and who should be consulted. Um, humility, patience, um, understanding that your wish to do this project might honestly be wrong in the context of their priorities. Um, and knowing that you have duty to consult uh, and weighing the caveats of that, which is that if you write and they don't write back, um, you have not consulted them. Um, you, have, you have simply shown yourself uh, unable to proceed without their, um, without their availability. Um, where possible, if you are working with another community or collaborating with another partner and they have subject matter expertise that you do not, um, ideally hire them to work. Uh, and if you can't, and then at the very least, I believe there is space in this grant for honoraria um, stipends, um, ways to compensate people for their expertise if you can't hire them on. Um, as the excellent Anna Neruda Moya said in the previous webinar in this series, um, do legal and ethical concerns mean you need to provide differential access. Um, and if no legal or ethical restraints prohibit it, how will you provide and encourage open access and reuse? Um, you have to be really, really sensitive to different concepts of consent. Um, you have to understand, for example, the easiest ones are children, people who uh, we think of as being incapable of consent, but certainly these are gonna, again, be your community's priority, not necessarily yours. Um, she also covered right statements and traditional knowledge labels. I'm going to reiterate how important they are. We're going to skip over these slides real quick, but they are there for you to uh, refer to later. Um, so right statements are really excellent, perhaps more so than Creative Commons for our purposes as heritage organizations. Um, CLEAR has great requirements about dedicating code and metadata to the public domain um, and not making spurious copyright claims to digitize materials. Um, uh, I think the quote is, you must not claim additional rights. Uh, digital copies of originals that are already in the public domain must also be in the public domain. Um, sometimes we don't know, which is why right statements are so fantastic. We have, uh, they have labels that will show things like orphaned works on certain copyright status. Um, places where you do have the copyright because it was given by deed of gift, um, but you don't have the ability to dedicate it to the public domain or uh, things are a little fuzzy, there are lots of labels to help you uh, identify those things. And there is a, an effort to create a Canadian um, version for these as well, which is fantastic because the original ones are specific to the US and to Europe. Um, she also mentioned, and I will reiterate traditional knowledge labels, um, even if you're not working specifically with indigenous materials in this case, these are a really, really wonderful conceptual way to think about rights and ethics. Um, if you're working through um, how and when these materials should be available, to whom should they be available, how do we do that on a technical level? Um, if we're doing it based on a logged in user and their self proclaimed status um, as traditional knowledge uh, labels would work, you know, um, some things are only available to certain genders, some things are only available at certain times of year. Can our technical platform accommodate that automatically, as in items just get hidden at certain times of the year uh, to everyone logged in or not, versus are there things that can only be available to logged in users who have also stated this about themselves? And uh, most technical systems are still going to rely on the honor system in terms of self declarations, but at least this is a really great way forward. Um, so just thinking about that. Uh, I believe next is also me. Um, again, long-term planning, uh, thinking about your organization, the nitty-gritty technical stuff. 
Um, do you have an institutional server who's responsible for it? Is it an IT department? Is it people internal to your department? Is it a totally external body? Do you have a contract? Um, who is maintaining it? Uh, who restores it when it goes down? How quickly do they promise to restore it? Is it in a contract? Um, how quickly do they update plugins? How often do they do security checkups? How often do they do error audits to see if there are error messages coming up? Um, is it in their contract? Is it in their calendar? Did they put it in their calendar? Very important question. Um, we're going to talk about lots of different uh, digital collections platforms. I have lots in my head. I'm happy to answer specific questions that you have about which one would be right for you. Um, in a general sense, you need to think about whether the technology you used uh, or you're, you're planning to use is supported. Is it um, for profit or non? Who's running it? Is it based in an academic institution? Does that mean it's reliable or not? Um, is it staffed? Is it volunteers who contribute to the code base? Is it grant funded on its own? Um, questions about private materials um, and things that are in copyright, as we talked about previously, some of those things will expire and move into the public domain. Some things are gonna be private for X number of years or until a certain thing happens, which means someone has to roll it over in the future. Um, who's opening it up? When will they be open? Who's in charge of it? Is it in their calendar? Put it in their calendar. Um, you will have your digital collection that's online and available, and you'll have some things that are private, but probably in the same system. Then you will have all of your project files, which is really important for you to have a paper trail of your own workflow. Um, if you're gonna be reliable to an external community who is collaborating with you, um, you need to be able to go through your own work and say, this is why we labeled it the way we did. This is why we did the metadata. Um, those things are really important. Um, put it all in one place. Make sure you know who has the passwords. Make sure that once it's all in one place, that one place gets into a locks model. Um, make sure that as you have active project hard drives for every workstation where someone is scanning things or doing metadata, those hard drives themselves are being regularly copied over onto your digital preservation system. And then those hard drives are moving out to different locations. Um, again, we'll talk, we'll talk more about the technical details and questions, I'm sure. Um, standard file naming, there's lots of easy ways for you uh, to Google and find recommendations on that. I didn't put any in this slide, um, but certainly organizing things in a logical way that adds some chronological ordering, um, as well as by department or staff or task. Oh, I didn't even write out the acronym. Thank you, Jess, of course. Um, so you're going to have, as Jess said, those raw files, those big, large things, the unrendered video, um, the spreadsheets, the many, many spreadsheets. Um, make sure they're labeled and make sure that they are actually understandable when you get into them. Um, I have lots of recommendations that I give to very small organizations about how to build your own LOX model. Um, in short, you should be able to confidently understand the system, no matter how who's running it or how it is set up. If it, again, is an IT department or your own department or somebody else. Um, if you're on an institutional shared server, you should know how many copies are actually being saved in the back end and how quickly it gets restored, um, how often those copies are being compared to each other to find out about when something is decayed. Um, you need to have two offline copies totally on your own under your own jurisdiction. Uh, ideally, both RAID drives, which is to say each drive itself is redundant. So there's a drive and it each has two copies and the drive itself can compare those two copies to each other and make sure that things don't fall apart. Um, those two drives that you have also need to be in two physical locations. Um, we're living in a time where um, you might find that one physical location is under danger of a wildfire and another physical location is about to be flooded within a week. Um, and also you might have a huge power outage that takes out all your servers. These are things you have to account for now. Um, it's not impossible, um, but you do have to plan for it. Um, if you're working with another organization, if you have a community uh, or contributors that you work with during the project, um, who's going to continue uh, letting that community contribute to the platform or control it? Um, who's moderating submissions if you're allowing, allowing user uploads? 
Who's moderating comments if your platform allows comments? Uh, is that person getting notifications? Are they checking regularly? Is it in their calendar? Um, do you have a takedown procedure for copyright or privacy concerns? You need a takedown procedure. Um, do you have an editing procedure if someone says you have my name wrong? Who's responsible for it? Is it in their calendar? Um, if you have no time left after the end of the project, uh, but your contributors want to have events um, or uh, continue on with these materials, do you have an agreement with them that allows them to take over the platform or contribute to the platform? Um, or for them to be able to go in and do these things on their own time if you can't contribute to it? I believe the next slide is over to Jess. Yes, um, yeah, good points. And I think um, in, also in summary to the last section was really document, 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 right? You need to have used this project cycle to start building up a binder of documentation around all of these things that we're talking about so that you've got something to refer to instead of, you know, one, one all roads lead to one person's brain, but that person just walked out the door. Um, make sure that there's some legacy uh, material left behind. Um, oh, but in terms of measuring and evaluation, that was one of the things that people noted they were really interested in um, in the poll at the beginning. Um, this is just a general idea around that, not necessarily uh, specific tools, but in terms of um, why you do measuring and evaluation, obviously it's about accountability um, at the grant end of things, but also it does help with, um, it gives value to track your activities and affects your continued planning internally while you're doing your project. So knowing that there are scheduled goals and milestones throughout the project provides structure to the activity for one thing. If you schedule meetings to discuss and present evaluations of ongoing outputs, quality and impact, that also acts as motivation. People um, get to see results all the time and can, um, this, use this to provide opportunities for improvement and also builds momentum for the project um, as well. And Alana will talk more about this, but obviously when you're, when you're getting your um, online platform, your digital platform ready, make sure that you've got tracking tools as part of that, whatever it is, if it's Google Analytics, um, because you want to use a third party or you've got something else going on or the platform has its own internal tracking tools, make sure that they're in place during the during the collection building process so that you can not only measure activity um, while it's being built and your own team access and impact um, so that you can measure how well the tool is working but then once it's launched that you get to start measuring the impact um, when it goes public um, this slide will have a few other little tips in it as well but i, I won't read them all out i'll just pass it over to elena Um, uh, as Jess said, are you tracking web traffic? How do you know who's using it and how often? Um, you do tread on some privacy lines here. You don't want to know necessarily the, the age and gender of every person that comes to your website, but certainly if there are some items that are getting more interest than others, um, that's really useful information for you to know. I love the impact playbook that Europeana put out, which is really useful for thinking about, we digitized it, we put it online, we, um, in the parlance of, of heritage organizations over many years, we lost control of it. Um, it's important for you to go and be able to say, we did this and it's great and it's useful and it has an impact on the world. Um, I'm reiterating myself a little bit, so I'll just move on quickly. Um, we also, uh, our digital world, when I worked for our digital world in a more official capacity, um, we did a study specifically of public libraries in Ontario that have local history collections and have been doing digitization. Um, I loved putting this report out and we collected a lot of quotes from people uh, specifically about how they track, what they do with it, um, such as reporting to their boards, um, using it to improve future digitization work, again, proving the impact and value of it so that you can go from project to program um, and planning other uh, outreach and fundraising, making more community events and getting more people involved, building that excitement and momentum. And I love this list of how people use it. Um, you should definitely go back and read this if you get a chance. 
Um, I want to mention also in terms of uh, assessing, assessing your impact on the world, um, think about broader than just your organization, thinking about the whole heritage field. If you are releasing code or metadata, um, if you're contributing to hubs like DPLA in the States, um, that's a great way to have great impact and also think about how to track that. Um, I'm sure DPLA offers you something, but I could not tell you what it is. Um, if you are building on open source software like the ones that I have listed um, here, Omeka, Islandora, um, Access to Memory, Archivematica, Archive Space, Collective Access, all things we can talk about later. Um, as Jess says, some of these have tracking, some of them have tracking modules that are optional, and some of them will require you to do totally external tracking. Uh, I'm not personally a fan of Google Analytics. There are a lot of independent open source analytics that do not come from a giant corporation. Um, I can look some up. I don't remember any of them offhand, but I know they exist. Um, Another thing you can do that's really great in terms of impact and allowing um, greater attention to your collections and greater attention from the outside world and possibly more collaborations in the future is to publish case studies, present at conferences, um, support your staff speaking about what it is they did and what they learned, uh, what they did wrong. Um, again, lead by example, mentor your staff, support them, uh, support them in professional development, push them out to conferences, push them to publish. Um, work with your communities, compensate those experts, the people who have subject matter expertise in, in these materials, um, push them to publish, push them to talk about what you've done, um, remove the sort of cone of secrecy in your institution about um, how hard the work is, how many mistakes you make. Um, it's really important that we talk about how hard this work is and how much work you put into things. You don't want to make it look easy because then people don't value it. Um, so you can lead by example by just talking about the work. Um, my next section is absolutely about to be skipped over. Um, these are here for you to look at later. All I really want to say about this is that if you're going to be doing math about long term planning, um, think not just about how much it costs you to do things now, but how much more it's going to cost you in the future. It's not just wildfires and floods. It's also changing temperature, uh, humidity. Your digital preservation system is going to be less reliable uh, and more prone to accidents in the future. Um, so these things I really want you to think about in terms of your budget, as well as the sort of ethics of uh, working around um, environmentally sustainable and unsustainable activities in our field. Um, Project ARC, Archives Responding to Climate Change, really fantastic. Um, this is about disaster planning. The Amanda Oliver, this just came out a few months ago, um, did a really wonderful survey of Canadian archives in terms of how they're dealing with these things, uh, disaster planning, wildfires, floods, digital preservation. Really, really fantastic. Um, and some of these have been uh, attempts at calculating the costs of what it is you're doing in terms of not just your budget of energy, but also emissions and how that's gonna change in the future. Um, as well as thinking about how you're gonna dispose of magnetic media items and, and uh, other uh, non-environmentally friendly materials dealing with the hardware uh, and equipment that you're buying, that sort of thing. Okay. I think that took longer than we wanted, but we still have lots of time for questions. Mm -hmm. I think that we will take a five minute break uh, to stretch and let all of that information sink into our brains. So if we can meet back here at four past the hour uh, to keep us on track, um, we will answer questions then. Sounds great.
All right, I think we can come back. Hope everyone uh, had a good little break and got to get up and stretch a bit. Um, please feel free to keep the questions coming in the chat. Um, and I think we're gonna circle back to some of the earlier questions that we got first. Um, one, one really good one was, um, if we want recordings to be usable by the public, the clarity of the uploaded version is also important. Is it acceptable to allocate funds for producing digitally restored versions of the files? If so, what would be an appropriate amount of restoration as a ratio of overall digitization costs? So I may toss that one to Joy to start us off. Yeah, Jess had offered a, um, a useful comment in the chat uh, when the question came in recommending that you get both the master, so your primary preservation copy of the original, and then perhaps um, a similarly um, quality of the enhanced copy. In terms of this program, um, our allowable costs don't prevent you from doing such restoration work. However, I will caution that AV restoration work has a tendency of being quite expensive. And you may find that our reviewers, um, when they're looking at the breadth of proposals available to fund, um, may start to question some of those extra activities. Um, so we, we often recommend that you would keep such activities to sort of a, a, a small percentage of your overall budget and maybe focus restoration work on a very specific subset of your materials. Perhaps there are extremely important recordings that may need that extra restoration work. Um, or maybe you want to do a pilot using some of the materials you're digitizing through this program. We're kind of uncertain how in this new program, um, this sort of work will be interpreted since we've shifted the priorities, the funding priorities significantly from the past. Um, but that would be sort of my recommendation based on the history of the program. Um, there's nothing stopping you, but we just caution, don't let that work take over your project. I personally have never uh, paid for this kind of restoration work. I think it's a fascinating question and I would love to look into it more. And I, it, I know that heritage organizations have a hard time hiring say a designer um, or somebody who has experience in video work like this. They, uh, we don't always advertise in the right place and they don't always see it. Um, but I wonder about whether it would be worth bringing someone in house, especially someone who's, you know, got, has, has a little bit of experience in this sort of thing and be, whether that might be cheaper. Um, but you, you would know better than I do about how much a vendor quote for this sort of thing costs, I think. Yeah, our experience comes more from our Recordings at Risk project, uh, our program, and Recordings at Risk explicitly prohibits this sort of restoration work because the point of that project is to come in and really immediately preserve however your at-risk AV materials are at the moment in time that you're digitizing them. So restoration work is outside the scope of the program. Um, in Hidden collections, uh, we just haven't seen the activity happening as much. Um, and there are folks that can do this work in-house. It's usually maybe more cost-effective to do the vendor. So then it's sort of part of the process as they're already reviewing the materials as they're being digitized. Um, they can identify problematic versions right away. Where it becomes an issue if you have low quality AV is if you're also working on the transcription and translation work or some other captioning work to increase the accessibility that you're hoping to offer. Um, so that's one argument that if you're considering this community-centered access to the materials, 
that restoration work might be critical because if you have garbled audio and can't understand what anybody's saying, how are you creating access in the end? Um, yeah, it's just, it's hard to give you a straight answer on this. I know I'm beating around the bush a lot, uh, but it's honestly because we just don't know how our review panel is gonna react um, to see it, but our recommendation would be to sort of focus on the digitization and be careful with restoration work. Yeah, I was gonna say, I'll just jump in and say that, you know, if you can get a vendor to come in or, or an expert um, in that, in that realm to come in and do an assessment, at least you can think about um, chunking out, you know, yeah. these, these recordings, I think we can just digitize them. These ones need restoration. Maybe we should consider doing something else. Like you say, just um, doing an in-house, really careful, really well-monitored transcription project instead of the restoration of the audio file. Um, you're going to capture the content uh, without necessarily um, preserving the original or the primary for forever, but at the same time, at least the content can still be shared and searched and so on. So um, it may be a way of um, also shaping your budget by thinking about things in chunks instead of assuming that all of the audio or video collections will need to that kind of restoration. I would, I would second that. The simplest file format you can get and the most accessible file format you can get might probably be the best choice. So uh, a readable transcript is mm -hmm. definitely a better option if you have to choose. Thank you. The next one um, asks, can you recommend any commercial companies for servers? Um, so I'll toss that one to Alana and Jess. Um, it First of all, are you in the States or in Canada? Um, you want to be very careful where your data is stored. In Canada, there aren't really very many commercial, well, I think the ones that do exist are technically nonprofits. So there aren't really very many nonprofits that specialize in maintaining and updating heritage specific platforms. Um, full disclosure, our digital world is one of them. And um, there's another one in uh, Vancouver, I think called And or Not. Um, who have managed Omeka hosting and that sort of thing. If you're not very interested in where your data is kept, which side of the border, or if you're in the States, um, Omeka does offer a, um, a hosted platform that you can pay for. Um, so if you go to omeka.net as opposed to omeka.org, they will do hosting for you. They have pricing. I think it's relatively transparent. Collective Access, I think, also offers it. You'll find this is quite frequent. If the code itself is open source software, they also offer a, a for sale hosting service for small organizations specifically. And I think if you're a museum, you might really wanna look at collective access more thoroughly. Um, but both of them would be great because both of them have lots of other features like um, virtual exhibits as well. Um, I find Omeka is great for a digital collections platform in terms of whatever kind of material you have. I really like it. I have less experience with the other ones, um, but I know collective access is, is quite museum heavy. I'm just wondering if um, Angela, I think Angela Proctor asked this question, if you were interested in server companies to perhaps be part of your digital preservation plan for the files that you're storing, or if you were thinking more about hosted platforms for access on these, because I think they're two different questions. Mm -hmm. And um, you're not gonna get a very detailed or very confident digital preservation plan out of pretty much anyone. Um, so uh, as I said before, I work for a historical association. The digital preservation is that they have the Omeka platform uh, managed through Softaculous, which is installed on the server. So it does daily backups and it promises to do restoration. That promise has yet to be um, fulfilled in action, so I don't know for sure if it's going to be really reliable. Omeka is a platform where you can accept public comments and public uploads, so if we lose one day's worth of somebody uploading their entire family history, that will be unacceptable. Um, my personal digital preservation system is very ad hoc. It's some hard drives. Um, again, it, it would take a lot of work to reconstitute an offline copy of a digital collections platform, um, but it's the best you can do. You can capture all the files in some format, but may 
not be very accessible, but you can reconstitute it if you have to. Um, but it's not the same thing as having, you know, two identical Omecas that are both running and you can flip the domain at a moment's notice. That one's very difficult. So your, your answers are not going to be great. Um, if you want to send me an email, we can talk about this in great detail. Thanks so much. The next one um, relates to that a little bit. Um, can you talk a bit about the expectations for digital platforms specifically for small museums? For example, this is the first big digitization project our organization has ever planned. Yay. And we are setting up our system. So we're wondering if our goals of making our simple database public and potentially contributing to local hubs is in line with CLEAR's goals for output. Yeah, I think I accidentally yeah, accidentally answered this one while I thought I was answering Angela. Um, so <laughs> um, I am not I'm not totally sure um, if there are any DPLA experts here in terms of harvesting metadata or um, uh, whether that is done automatically technically and whether it works with lots of different platforms or if it's really like export a spreadsheet, send it to them, they ingest the spreadsheet you may need to redo that every week or something like that. Um, so I love the idea of making a simple database public and popping it into local hubs that are a little more easily accessible and widely known. Um, sometimes the technical solution is not easy. Um, and in Canada, we don't have a hub, so um, it's not really a problem for us, unfortunately. And I, I mean, I would say too, just as an encouragement, for those of you who are new to digitization and maybe leveraging this project as just talked about, uh, talked about into a program, um, our reviewers understand that as organizations, you all are dealing with very different levels of capacity, built-in infrastructure, um, those questions like that. So I think be encouraged and be confident with the plan that you present, explain why that plan with your database and making it accessible and thinking about local hubs is the plan that is right for you and your organization and the community that you're hoping to serve and just present a compelling case. Um, we have funded so many different things and it's one of the reasons why our program doesn't tell you what platform you have to use. Um, because we recognize that this will look very different depending on where you are. And I certainly think that if you have your stuff in past perfect or, or some other system that you've had for a long time and you're familiar with, that's not necessarily a good argument to keep it there forever. This grant might really be a great opportunity for you to migrate to something um, that is a little more harvestable and a little more technically ready to really expose your materials as best as possible. Not yeah. to not to call out or or defame past perfect in any way. I'm very sorry. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. I think it depends on um, when you say a simple database. If it's an in-house thing, is it even sustainable? And who's going to maintain it um, after the project? But the idea that it does start to um, flow up and out into other um, collections or or display and search and display portals, that kind of thing. I think that's a really important thing to consider. Um, Past Perfect, I know, is um, for DPLA, it is a um, spreadsheet kind of an export for them to harvest. It's not it's not a click, a click of the button kind of an export. So um, it's, yeah, it's a little bit harder to work with Past Perfect in that environment, if that's, if that is what, um, Margaret, you're going for. I think I was actually thinking of InMagic, um, which we're all we all remember from library school probably. So um, yeah, there are some very, there's some databases that are very distant from being accessible. Oh, okay. <laughs> it was past perfect. Good guess. Mm -hmm. On to the next. Um, so how should one write a job description um, for the grant if the current person at the organization may or may not be there 
to see the project to fruition. That is, if you know someone is going to be there, you can write about their qualifications. If you know you will need to hire someone for a position, you write a description of someone you will hire. But what do you do if you do not know for sure whether you will need to hire or not? The job description. Question. Sorry, the, the jobs. I think the job description should be written for the activities that are required, as opposed to who the person is that you're trying to hire. Um, if you know what I mean, because the um, obviously the if you have an in-house person who has all the qualifications, then they should be able to rise to the top of the applicant pool. Um, but similarly, if you were to put that job description out. Uh, into the wider world, you should get someone who's equally as qualified. Um, it's it really shouldn't be about the person. I I I think I have some respect for really wanting to support people that you know and keep them oh, around. Sure. Yeah. Um, it's certainly good for the organization if you don't have to onboard somebody new. Um, but I also know that sometimes that tiptoes in the direction of cronyism, so you want to be careful there. Mm -hmm. um, there's a recent example. There's an organization here in Canada that is putting out sort of an RFQ um, to have someone come in as a digitization contractor. And they said the project is really based on the person who shows up and what their skills are. If they can do complicated stuff, we'll do complicated stuff with them for a shorter period and pay them better. And if they can't do complicated stuff, we'll have them do simpler stuff and pay them for longer, which is a very strange way of going about it. But I think it's a great example of how confused many of us are when it comes to these situations. Um, yeah, don't write about the person's qualifications, write a job description that, as you know, lots of applicants have like 40% of the qualifications, so you're going to be flexible anyways. Um, but do write about the skills that you want and know perfectly well that you may be training the person that you have or training someone else on some of those skills. Um, mm -hmm. It's a grant project. That's how this works. There's going to be some learning. Yeah. Great. Next up is, have any of the speakers or staff recommended excision of PII um, before digitization as a method to limit the risk of harm? And PII is personally identifiable information. Um, I can take this to a point. Um, we work with an organization, for example, who is digitizing an enormous number of scrapbooks um, from women's institutes around Ontario. And part of their workflow is to, uh, they digitize the whole scrapbook and then their team goes through those scrapbooks and makes sure that it meets uh, their own criteria for not exposing personally identifying information um, before they make it public. So the, the tool that they're using, the Vita Toolkit, allows them to keep everything non-public until they're ready to flip the switch. Um, they can even uh, withhold or keep non-public certain pages if that's where that information lies, or they can make it uh, non-searchable, even mm -hmm. though it would be browsed by eye if they turned off certain parts of the text. So um, there are different ways of going about it. It's a very... Um, it's a very time consuming process. Um, they have a number of volunteers working on it all the time to make sure that they're not exposing personal information. On the other hand, in things like newspaper uh, digitization projects that we work on and where we have clients that are um, putting up more current newspapers, we're getting more and more personal information removal requests mm -hmm. um, whether it's births, marriages or deaths. Um, some people don't want that kind of information exposed online. They put it in the local paper, but they don't want it online. And then uh, other things are things like, um, you know, um, police charges. Um, of course, the police blotter always likes to talk about who gets charged, but they never talk about whether or not that person is um, not actually um, charged fully and, you know, Convicted. under arrest. So. Yeah. <laughs> so then they don't want, you know, they're going for a job search and they don't want that information as part of their Google history, essentially online. So there, I think that there's two approaches. One is to either digitize fully um, and then remove it after the digital copies have come to you. At least you've got master of the original. Um, and potentially as time goes on, you can start releasing information. I don't remember what the timelines are around that exactly, but, um, and then the other thing is to have, um, 
depending on your content and the, the kind of personal identification, uh, identity information that's going out, you can have a policy about how you're going to deal with requests for removals and make sure that that's really in place and everybody knows about it and it's well documented and it's very easy to find and maybe even on your website because you want to make sure that that's a consistent treatment of, the, of uh, those requests. Mm -hmm. Right to be forgotten legislation is, I think, very fluid and uh, unstable right now. So it's not meeting the letter of the law. It's meeting meeting that duty of ethics of care um, mm -hmm. to the to the people represented. If you think this material is a good candidate for digitization, it probably should not include personal identifying information or sensitive information in the first place. Um, it's great to say that, you know, the, the lesbian magazine of On Our Backs should have been digitized and shared because it's really interesting and representative and it gets, um, you know, a different perspectives out into the world. But when the company, um, I want to say Reveal Digital, uh, did that, they didn't get consent from every author uh, or every mm -hmm. person who was in a photo. Um, not everybody wants to have their lesbian status from the 1970s put on the internet in 2015. Mm -hmm. um, so you need to really assess that even before you get your final application in, I think. Um, excision is an option. It's a labor intensive option. You mm -hmm. need to budget for it. Um, don't, don't get caught unawares at the end. Uh, yeah. There's a really there are a couple of really wonderful blog posts if you Google on our backs and reveal digital. For those of you that, who have not heard of it, I think that that those suggestions are key. Um, I know a lot of you have been emailing us in the last weeks or so asking about some of the reviewer comments dealing with rights ethics reuse when when to excise information when to block. Um, and I think our review panel is looking for evidence that you've thought about it, just like Alana and Jess have said. They, they want to see that you're not going to get caught unaware and surprised. So um, maybe estimating approximately how much of your collections may be problematic and contain any sort of PII. Um, and then explaining what is your plan? Are you going to do a takedown notice? Are you going to have people scanning these, um, not scanning as in like scanning as digitization, but looking through your digital files for that information and coming up with how you're going to block it out? Will you allow full access to a limited audience compared to only limited access to all audiences? Just say your plan, think it through. Mm -hmm. All right, so we'll take these two final questions that we have, and then we will wrap up. Um, is there a rule of thumb for how long it takes to digitize photographic materials, i.e. estimate um, estimate five or 10 minutes for each of them? I know there are digitization calcula calculators, but they seem to be focused on estimating costs, and I'm just hoping for a rough time estimate. Um, I can definitely refer you to the digitization cost calculator from the DLF. Um, I'll drop the link here in the chat. And it, it does um, give you an output of estimated cost, but also um, time based on the individual who's doing it, what level um, they are at, and um, it'll give you an output based on all the information you put in. Um, so I definitely encourage you to check it out because I think you can get um, what you're looking for from that. But um, others, please feel free to chime in. I was just thinking that um, it's one thing to, to you know, scan, scan a uh, photograph once, but um, you should probably think about also whether you're going to be um, deriving new files from that if you're working with textual items or you're going to be running it through OCR software. So, uh, all of those processes should be probably taken to an, into account as you are thinking about staff time um, dedicated to digitization activities in general. So it's not just the one, it's not just the one flatbed swoop swoop. Um, it's actually getting it rendered into all of the formats that you need. I, I keep thinking that my rule of thumb for a photograph is closer to uh, an hour or two, um, just from like, 
retrieving an individual item from wherever, exactly. you know, re retrieve the box, pull the item, scan it both sides, fill out the spreadsheet as much as you can, come back to it later to continue filling out the spreadsheet, do your copyright, do your privacy, decide if it's a photo you're going to put online and ask specific questions so people can contribute, you know, do you know the person in this photo, do you know the location, can you guess the year, um, whether you're going to label it as an orphaned work, whether you're going to do this and that, um, you know, make it an hour or two, and a lot of that relies on whether you know how to batch process things later, or whether mm -hmm. you're going to be opening every file doing doing something repeatedly on every file. Um, so it, it really matters as to what you can assess as your own technological capacity in your organization and your ability to get that training or find those skill sets. Mm -hmm. I hope an hour or two is manageable. I really think that's that's my most honest answer. <laughs> it doesn't sound very positive. <laughs> I, I mean, if anything that we've learned from our years of of helping the grant recipients with these digitization projects is however long you think it will take, it will always take longer. <laughs> so. Yes, sorry. An hour or two plus 100%. Yes. I'm sorry. I forgot that part. <laughs> I mean, honestly, from I mean, we talked some um, with all of you about your estimations of collections, and maybe you want to, to think about estimating a little bit lower having your time fit within your time frame and end up surprising yourselves as you're able to speed up your process and get more um, in line with what you're doing and find that you can add stuff at the end because you have this time left over. Um, but it it's will always really take longer point. than what you think. It's a really good point to estimate the slow early learning phase versus the, okay, I think I got it now phase, definitely. Uh, and redoing the early work, you know, your first two months might have to get redone entirely. Important, to put that in your timeline. So I think we have one more question and I know we are at time. So if anybody does have, we will not feel any worse for that. Um, mm -hmm. And we'll, we'll have this full transcription of the Q&A posted online. Um, I was just We're trying gonna... to remember if we have our contact information in one of these slides, because I'd the be the very happy. beginning, I think. Yes. Mm. Your very first slide, and we'll share that too, if you don't mind, in our, our Q&A document as well. Mm -hmm. um, so the last question is, we're a small Indigenous-run museum proposing a project to digitize oral history recordings and historic accounts. We would be creating access to some materials online through Eve Museum via our website, but not for the audiovisual materials. Would providing summaries of these materials on eMuseum that are available for free access to transcripts, listening, watching via our physical archives be sufficient? Also, are we required to have metadata for files present on platforms other than our own servers? That sounds like a clear question. We can answer that. <laughs> um, <laughs> So you are definitely allowed and encouraged to provide the access that you think is appropriate for your materials. So if, um, if there's only limited access, you might want to provide metadata just to let people know that these things exist. Um, and you're allowed to decide how you wanna do that as well. So maybe you want to provide collection level metadata um, rather than item level descriptions of each of these AV materials. Um, but yes, so if, if providing summaries is what you think is most appropriate to give the access that you would like to provide, make that case in your application to explain why that is the way that you'd like to move forward. Uh, the second Part of your question, are, you, are we required to have metadata for files present on platforms other than our servers? I'm reading this two different ways, so I'm going to answer it two different ways. If you're asking about um, providing additional access, like pointing to your collections and different aggreg aggregators or hubs of things, we don't require that. Um, if you decided that you're only going to provide access through your own servers 
on your collections and you think that that is the best plan for your materials, which I can understand as a small indigenous museum, that may be your best plan. Make that case. Um, and that's fine. If you're asking about uh, like, if there's other files of related collections on other servers um, and you'd like to point access out to those, um, I don't know if that's how you're asking that question, um, but if it seems like providing links to other collections would be a useful server service, um, it might be something you could consider, but we don't necessarily have a requirement unless those materials were digitized through funds in this program, um, then we do have that requirement that you provide metadata for all of the things you've digitized. If all of that was super confusing, and if any of our questions or answers were confusing, do feel free to email us directly with more specific information about your project. And we can um, get you an email written response from the team um, and think a little bit more specifically about your situation. Yeah, I obviously don't work for the grants team, but if we're talking about ethics and you being accountable to your community, certainly advertising online for members of your community who have gone to other physical locations in the world that you have this stuff and they might want to talk to you about it, that's really important. But if you want to restrict actual access to the materials to people uh, in person, I think, I hope the grant allows for that because it's certainly something we have lots of other communities want to do. Even, even you know, a settler community that has a local newspaper, they put the metadata entry online, but they insist people come in or at least call to talk about it because they want to talk to people and give context and help with research queries and build interpersonal relationships um, for the organization and its users. Um, and that's really important. Yeah, there is definitely allowance for that sort of model in this program. Okay, so we have um, an, another quick poll for anybody still left with us. So we can check in to see how you're feeling now here at the end of the session. Um, and we're gonna go ahead and launch that so you can tell us how you're feeling. Yeah, thank you all so much to those of you who stuck around. Um, we have two more of these sessions planned. Um, our next one is gonna be on October 14th um, and it'll cover staffing, budget and outcomes in a lot more detail. Um, and we're excited to share that Stacey Williams at Chicago Public Library will be um, leading that one. She um, helped to lead a hidden collections project during her time at the University of Chicago. Um, so we're excited to be talking with her. It looks like everybody's still feeling somewhat somewhat prepared. We didn't get anybody into that completely com prepared, but hopefully as you start to tackle this and ask us any other questions you might have, you will feel more confident about these plans and this element. Huge thanks to Alana and Jess. Um, it has been really fun to work with you and you shared a lot of really valuable information. Um, and thanks everybody we hope to see you next time please take care and don't forget thanks the so survey much. yes <laughs> please do the survey